about the, the juncture in the 16th century between religious revolution and social change. Or to put it more precisely, we are talking about the interaction between the Protestant Reformation and the advent of capitalism. And we have set out, in trying to analyze that problem, uh, the theory of the German sociologist Max Weber, uh, which had been amended and improved and extended uh, by Richard Tawney in a very great and classic book called Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, uh, which contended that there was a very close connection between the Protestant work ethic and the behavioral requirements of capitalism. For as Faber argued the case, capitalism, in order to be organized, in order to extend its dominion, really involved a tremendous revolution in human personality. That it involved nothing short than a retooling of the human personality in order to adapt to that system. It meant, after all, the adaptation of both the entrepreneur and the wage earner to relentless, unremitting work. It meant the rationalization of daily economic activity, eliminating all of those paroxysms of irregularity, eliminating all of those forays into idleness, which after all defy the bureaucratization of daily life. It involved in the third place that kind of single-minded concentration upon material success, and with that, after all, a commensurate hatred of failure, a kind of self-destructive interpretation of failure, as though poverty, after all, were the sign of some kind of moral humility, the sign of some kind of personal incompetence. In a word, it involved a kind of warping and twisting of the human personality, a purging out of it of all of those emotional instincts, a suffering, a suffocation of all of those cries for irregularity and spontaneity until, you see, homo economicus, which certainly is one of the most grotesque inventions of self-repression imaginable, should be born. In that light, they were argued, the Protestant doctrine of the calling, or more precisely, the Calvinist doctrine of the calling, played a crucial and capital role. Because you must understand that in the Protestant schema, the Christian, after all, cannot depend upon the intercessionary help of certain kinds of actions that are called good works, which Catholicism had interposed in order to influence God, in order to influence that final judgment on salvation. In the Protestant schema, the Christian was puny, was helpless, was naked before a God that was so omnipotent, so distant, that in no way could he be touched or reached. And consequently, the Christian stood dumbstruck, stood mute, stood without any resources, and had no alternative but to follow the path that was laid out by the Puritan and Calvinist divines and moralists, to work unremittingly and without any respite, and certainly to go for success, to try to succeed, because success, after all, was the only possible sign there was that God's grace had been shed upon that Christian and that he was of the elect. So to favor that success, that poverty, after all, was to become a shame. All of that, you see, involved that twisting and warping of the personality that would be so critical and important in Weber's terms to the so-called capitalist personality. Because in that way, Protestantism forced human beings to internalize the compulsive work ethic and to internalize that kind of frenetic time consciousness. It forced them to make that tremendous distinction between success and failure, success measured only in material terms. It forced them to be thrifty and consequently to compile that capital which was so important for investment. It forced them to be regular and consequently to send the working class, the laboring poor, daily off to its slaughter.
And finally, Protestantism, after all, cleared the behavioral terrain. It cleared the behavioral terrain so that the joys of capitalism were possible, so that the submission of the laboring poor was possible. And if I may add my own note, it cleared that behavioral terrain so that it brought forth in our own time the most capitalistic industry of all, that very grim and dismal but always burgeoning trade of psychiatry. <laughs> And consequently, it is in that light that there is something meaningful about the theory of Max Weber and of Richard Tawney, that they were on to something extremely important. Now let me say it very clearly, that I am much too much Marxist to think that an ideology ever changes a society by itself, and I'm perfectly aware that there is an objective base, a material base, for the advent of capitalism. That after all, it emerged out of the expansion of markets and out of the adaptation of a mode of production in order to meet those markets. But likewise, too close a student of Marx ever to fall into that vulgar economic determinism, which eliminates as a factor in social change the very great and very powerful importance of ideology. And we will return to that question when we deal, for example, with those kinds of behavioral mutations, with those kinds of ideological changes in the 18th century, when we talk about the ambourgeois mark of society as capitalism is triumphant. But let me just note in passing that the case of Weber and Tawney is actually stronger than they even thought. That we can adduce, for example, and document that case by a body of evidence which they never touched and which was not at their disposal. For I would point out in passing that the Protestant centers of the 16th century became veritable laboratories of sexual repression. It is there that all of that instrumentality of how you repress the emotions really is forged and is sharpened. That the leaders of the Protestant Reformation were themselves obsessed with the idea of what they called sins of the flesh. So there you have Martin Luther racked up by his sexual fears as he is trying to live the life of chastity in the monastery, freaked out by nocturnal emissions, and all the more, and all the more by the fact that he wasn't always asleep. And <laughs> in a formulation that has become classic and that really does wed production to repression, who could put as a formula that the carnal man accomplishes naught. A Martin Luther who said over and again that when he went to bed with his wife, the devil slept in between them. Fortunately, a man of long reach. But if <laughs> dealing with something that really becomes obsessive. And there you have Calvin's Geneva, for example, where the elders of the Calvinist church became absolutely frenetic in the pursuit of prostitutes and in the pursuit of adulterers and put upon them of the most heinous of punishments, saving the worst, the most exquisite and the cruelest for homosexuals who were systematically beheaded in Calvin's Geneva, considering as they did, and quite rightly, that these homosexuals stood objectively as the genuine subversives of any society that would separate sexuality from pleasure and that would reduce it simply to the reproductive purpose. And consequently, that condition went to the very extreme. Or think of that Protestant England in the 16th century, in the reign of that most Protestant king of all, Edward VI, where you get so clearly inscribed in the law and in institutions that kind of nexus between compulsive work and sexual repression, so that in Bridewell there is a special punitive agency that is established, a house of condition for prostitutes in 1553. 
degree, uh, where the women are put in blue uniforms, and where they are limited uh, to compulsive and to forced labor, and worse than that, where they are terrorized uh, by the constant inculcation of the value of compulsive work. Or consider that it is out of Protestant culture in the 16th century that emerges something with which we have lived ever since, that emerges that tremendous fear of and that sense of shame about nudity, that it comes to be the time when any display of nudity becomes simply a disgrace, a social crime, uh, so that what you are talking about is the fracturing of social relationships uh, based upon trust and transparency. Uh, what you are doing is to relegate arrows imprisoned and chained now to that netherland of very sick fantasy and furtiveness. And all of that, you see, uh, comes out of this 16th century. How much damage is all of that? How much does that add up to? Can you not all write biographies and autobiographies that add historical documentation to that? And I think of that poor Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, so absolutely wrapped up with his sexual fears, somebody who fundamentally could never shake off that growing up process in such a repressive Calvinistic household in which he grew up, so that poor Jean-Jacques when he came to write that novel, A Meal, which is his great book on education and how a young child should be educated for a new and a better society, a separated uh, that poor A Meal uh, from any social contact, uh, separated him from any uh, companionship, unless uh, he should be stirred up emotionally, unless uh, he should be led onto that road of sinfulness and diverted uh, from the path of his social duty. And I yield to no one uh, in my sense of appreciation uh, for Rousseau in the 18th century and what it was uh, that he saw really in the marrow of his bone uh, about the ravages of a class-ridden society. Uh, but I swear to God that I would a thousand times rather be marooned on a desert island with Voltaire or Diderot who were purged of a sense of guilt uh, than that with that guilt-ridden John Jacques Rousseau, who would drive you crazy if you ever went behind a tree. Because what you have there is something fundamental, something that adds a dimension uh, to what Weber and Tommy uh, talked about. Uh, but let it be said uh, that if, after all, uh, we delimit uh, the discussion of the relationship uh, between the Protestant Reformation and capitalism uh, to its Weberian terms, uh, that we really ignore uh, too many problems. Uh, in the first place, uh, we can't delimit it uh, because then uh, we don't make uh, the very critical point uh, that Luther and Calvin, uh, the great progenitors uh, of the uh, Protestant Reformation, in neither case uh, was a self-conscious partisan, a self-conscious outrider uh, of capitalism. Uh, that both of them, after all, uh, objected uh, violently uh, to any such proposition uh, as the inviolable and the imprescriptible right of private property. Uh, that both of them, and Calvin especially, uh, placed very strong strictures uh, upon the property holder uh, who had duties uh, that had to be performed uh, to the community. And in the second place, uh, we can't limit the discussion to the area in terms because then we would ignore that revolutionary force of which the Reformation uh, generates in 16th century uh, European society. Uh, for as I started to point out at the end of our last hour, uh, that 16th century is an age not only of economic expansion but a tremendous social dislocation. It's an age uh, when the price revolution, uh, when the enclosure movement, uh, when the putting out system uh, shatters customary social relationships and begins to erode customary social hierarchies. Uh, within that context, uh, the Protestant Revolution, uh, which was launched in the 16th century, whatever 
of the social conservatism of its leaders was, perforce, would trigger and touch off a mass and popular revolt, creating, after all, vast options in this society, making of the 16th and 17th century a time of choices, choices not that end only uh, in the capitalist way of life and the capitalist mode of production, uh, for we're talking about revolutionaries who had other goals, who rose up for other purposes than the kind of society of which ultimately emerged, and we have already begun to see that. We went back a century, and we saw what it could mean, uh, that nexus uh, between religious and social revolution in the great Kabbalite uh, movement uh, of the 15th century in Bohemia. And we saw uh, that simply the attack in, in that 15th century Bohemia uh, by non Huss and others uh, upon the wealth and the authority of the church uh, triggered uh, the Kabbalite movement, which for a 16-year period, uh, from 1420 uh, to 1436, institutionalized in one city or one town or one village and another the whole process of anarcho-communism. Uh, granted, of course, uh, that in the final analysis of the Taborite movement, uh, that anarcho-communism uh, failed and was defeated. Uh, for you must remember uh, that from 1420 on, uh, the German emperor at that time uh, sent an invading Catholic army uh, into Bohemia uh, to crush the Hussite movement. And you must remember in the second place that that Hussite movement was divided uh, between a majority of Catholics who were radical and a minority of conservatives called Utraquists who were, after all, uh, the nobility of Bohemia and the rich merchants and who wanted a religious reform and who wanted expropriation of church wealth, but that was all who wanted no reform in the secular life at all. And you must remember, finally, uh, that within uh, the Taborite communities themselves, uh, there was a sectarian division and also a failure, a patent failure, ever to devise a proper strategy of economic growth or of economic supply uh, for those communities. But having said that, let's not ignore the force of that Taborite movement which turned Bohemia upside down for a decade and a half, and which gives us such decisive evidence that there is that nexus between religious and social revolution. You touch off one, and in that age of widespread social alienation and economic misery, you touch off the other. Remember, after all, uh, that you are dealing in these Taborite communities with radicals and revolutionaries who line up the peasant and the proletarianized masses. Uh, you are dealing with radicals and revolutionaries who know what they want and how to get it, uh, who do not, despite their religious inspiration, uh, put off uh, the new society uh, to the appearance of a messiah or the appearance of a miracle, uh, but who say that it will come out of the past war itself. And we find in a text of the Kabbalites this concept of that class war. All wars, nobles, and excessively rich merchants must be cut down like outlaws, or uh, there will be no peace uh, for the poor. And when those communities were founded, uh, they were founded <laughs> on two principles that were repeated over and again, and that were institutionalized for short or long periods of time. One was communism of goods. And so we find in a Taborite text, all shall live together as brothers and sisters, and none shall be subject unto another. And secondly, that political ideal of anarcho-communism, which you find in the outline among the communards of Paris in 1871, that the society should be based upon autonomous cities and towns and villages that themselves were anchored unto popular sovereignty. And when they got into those communities, sometimes they lasted long, sometimes less than a year, but at all times, 
jobs, they expropriated from the rich, they established treasuries for common goods so that each supplied himself out of that common treasury. And what is so terrific that they did sail that whole humbo jumbo of superstition, of fantasy, of which after all had been uh, the very anchor uh, of people's lives. And so they said uh, there will be no more worship of relics. And so they said uh, that there will be no more uh, belief in purgatory. And so they said uh, there will be no more stupid prayers for the dead. Uh, there is a demystification process that is going on, and you see. If it happens in Bohemia in the 15th century, on the basis of Jan Hus's attack upon the church of that local area, what will it be? How can Luther and Calvin damn the tie, no matter how much they might want, if they assail the whole church of all of Christendom and split it? Well, the answer takes us to Martin Luther, and it takes us to the revolution of his time. And I might know parenthetically that I think this very weekend is John Osborne's film on Luther. It won't tell you all the things that I'm going to tell you, but it is nonetheless quite interesting if you want to see a <laughs> And you must remember that when you deal with Luther, you are not dealing with a social theorist, you are not dealing with a revolutionary strategist, you are dealing with a theologian, who is obsessed with the idea of his own salvation and the problem of achieving it, but who was compulsive enough in the quest for his own safety that he was willing and able to shatter the authority principle of 16th century society. That Luther is born on the 10th of November of 1483 in the town of Eisleben in Saxony. And by legend, to which Luther himself contributed, it has been said that he was the son of poor peasants. Not so. To be sure, Hans Luther, his father, had grown up in his early years on the grandfather's farm, but had left that farm in his early twenties to go first to Eisleben and then to the mining center of Mansfeld, a center of silver and copper mining, to do the trade of mining. And Hans Luther succeeded rather well and became a shareholder in a mining company and became a shareholder in small forges and consequently is a small early capitalist who invests his capital carefully, who safeguards that capital with his life, and who safeguards most the capital that will bring him most the education and the well-being of his son. And so this is a typical bourgeois, this father, ambitious. And consequently, the boy Martin will not be a minor. He will be a lawyer, my son Martin, the lawyer. Or he will be a, or he will be a jurist, or he will become a town magistrate. And consequently, a good education will be provided for him. But in the interim, that your boy has to be beaten into his ambition, has to be beaten into his success, and consequently the father is cruel and harsh. And there is a statement all quoted by Luther. My father whipped me so hard that once I ran away, ran away and felt very ugly toward him. And so it is the terrific struggle with the father. And so it is the hatred of the father principle. And so it is the attack upon that authority principle important for us to know. It helps us to understand why that tremendous invective, that tremendous venom at the papa, at the pope, at the father after all of everybody, <laughs> and consequently you universalize it. And it is that father hate after all which becomes the very plinth upon which Eric Erickson, in that very fruitful exercise in psychohistory called Young Man Luther, rests his case. Because, you see, it does explain a great number of things in that remarkable, extraordinary, neurotic career 
It helps us to understand, for example, how it was that that hatred, that home of authority, came to be universalized in Luther into an attack upon universal authority. And that transferal is cited this way by Eric Erickson. This much, I think, one can say about the paternal side of Martin's childhood dilemma. Faced with a father who made questionable use of his brute superiority, a father who had at his disposal the techniques of making others feel morally inferior without being quite able to justify his own neural superiority, a father to whom he could not get close and from whom he could not get away, faced with such a father, how was he going to submit without being emasculated or rebel? without emasculating the father. Millions of boys face these problems and solve them in some way or another. They live, as Captain Ahab says, with half of their heart and with only one of their lungs, and the world is the worst for it. But now and again, an individual is called upon. Called by whom? Only the theologians know. And by what? Only bad psychologists. To lift, <laughs> to lift his individual patienthood to the level of a universal one and to try to solve for all what he could not solve for himself alone. And it helps us to explain what is certainly demonstrable in that biographical line of Luther, which is that really quite incredible reality of that constant reference in his speech to reality, and also simply that physical syndrome, which were these horrendous and raw facts of with constipation. Because after all, you're dealing with a physical barrier of what becomes a psychic disorder. It is, after all, that you have and you build up all of these horrendous resentments, all of these hatreds, and you are afraid, and you cannot really attack the father. You cannot attack the authority. You keep it in and hold it in until there is a torrential outpouring. And all of Luther's life, both physically and psychically, and certainly emotionally, there are those alternating rhythms of tremendous retention and tremendous release. And after all, was so most certainly going to talk about that over and again. You know, Luther is not your ordinary refined priest. Luther is vulgar as can be, earthy in a very good sense, but his language is disgraceful. And consequently, at dinner before, in 1520, before he really makes that horrendous breach, he explains to everyone in scatological language, which is his favorite imagery, explains, after all, what it is all about, and I give you a definition of the Reformation that comes from Luther himself, and he said at the dinner table, I am like ripe shit, and the world is a gigantic asshole. We will probably let each other go soon. <laughs> it helps us to explain something very fundamental, which is the failure of Luther himself to carry this religious revolution to the social plane. In other words, the failure to go all the way, because once again, there is a psychological mechanism that really must be at work. It is, after all, to defy the father, but not to emasculate him, not to kill him all. And consequently, you dethrone the church, but you make another church. You dethrone the religious authority, but you leave the secular authority in place. You do not really destroy the authority principle, only the one that is oppressing you. And certainly helps us to explain why that Lutheran church became so male chauvinist, why it became so male dominated. Because the center, after all, of Luther's concern was the struggle with the Father. And it was an effort, after all, in the whole building of that church to retain male authority, not to destroy it, to displace or replace it, to keep, after all, his own sense of masculinity intact. Kierkegaard's comment that Luther invented a religion for the adult man states the limitation as well as the true extent of Luther's theological creation. Luther provided new elements for the Western man's identity, created for him new roles, but he contributed perhaps only one feminine identity, the parson's wife, 
And this solely because his wife, Catherine of Bora, created it with the same determined unselfconsciousness with which she made the great doctor marry her. Otherwise, the Lutheran Revolution only created ideals for women who wanted to be like Parsons if they couldn't be like Parsons' wives. And in spite of Catherine and her children, what, what, wherever Luther's influence was felt, the mother of God was dethroned. Luther refers to her sneeringly as one of the female saints who might induce a man to hang on their necks or hold on their skirts. And there is something important and influential about that. But the boy obeyed and consequently went off to school and went first to the cathedral school at Pachtebera to perfect Latin, and then went on to the University of Erfurt, and took a degree in the year 1502 in philosophy, and then entered the faculty of law uh, to become the jurist his father wanted, but no. There was that day, the 2nd of July of 1505, and there was Luther walking in a village near the city of Erfurt, and there came the conversion, or at least he wouldn't go to law school. And the conversion, after all, came through a tremendous sudden uh, thunderstorm. And it struck lightning very close to him. And he was frightened to death and uttered out, Oh, St. Anne, help me, I want to be a monk. <laughs> that he called on St. Anne is not surprising. She was his father's patron saint. And if he was going to get out of law school with that Hans Luther, he would need intercession. <laughs> Two weeks later, he went and rapped at the door of the monastery of the Augustinians in Erfurt and asked to be admitted as a monk, was admitted provisionally, and there he was. And at that time, that Augustinian monastic order was in the hands of a vicar general named Johannes Stolpen. <laughs> And Stauffer was really the kindliest father substitute Luther ever had, a rather wise and gentle and learned man who recognized in young Luther certainly a great academic talent, a great kind of intelligence, and consequently sent him off to the new University of Wittenberg in order to perfect his study of theology so that he would have an academic career and teach. So Luther becomes a doctor of theology in 1512 and begins to lecture in the University of Wittenberg on the epistles of Paul, on the texts of St. Paul, and it is in the year 1515 that he is meditating the epistle to the Romans 117 and finally comes to that point of departure for his own a theological a breach. Uh, because, as he said, it opened the door to paradise for him. 117 Romans is the place in which St. Paul, as he concludes that particular paragraph, says, and the just shall live by faith alone. And so it is an attack upon the Catholic doctrine of works, upon the idea that there is something that the Christian can do in his own life, through his works, in order to placate God. No, no. It is now Luther's conception that that free will is wrong. It now becomes Luther's conception that justice, God's justice, isn't at the end of some point of time, isn't in some future day of judgment, where God sort of tumps up the balance and decides whether there have been enough merits or not. And that God's justice is here and now. It is within the Christian. It is within the heart. It is within the smithy of the soul. It is by faith by the faith that God provides in order that one should serve his salvation perpetually in his life. Now let's face it, that there is for Luther a tremendous personal relief in all of that. This was really a tortured man, and one wrapped up by the idea that he wouldn't make it. All of his surroundings had been very loveless ones, his own household, of the monastery, which was harsh in its discipline. Whatever Luther did, didn't seem to be enough, seemed always as though he were a failure and would not make it 
that somehow he would be judged a failure, that he would be left behind. And all the time, thinking that all of mankind is so weak and so piddly, how can anybody do it? God's demand is much too great. And so you transfer and you move from a harsh God, the judge, uh, who is embedded in all of those laws and all of that ritual, and you move to God the Savior, who knows that mankind, after all, is weak and puny, uh, but who makes his reconciliation uh, through the cross. And so by 1516, Luther, in a commentary that he makes upon that epistle to the Romans, really abandons Catholic free will and moves to the plane of justification by faith alone. Or with this commentary, we live and die in inequity and in injustice. And we are justified only by the intervention of God and by faith in his word. Now that, of course, means that there is a point of no return between Luther and the Catholic Church. It means that the attack upon the whole strategy of works, which is very central unto Catholic theology, will be inevitable. But think of something else, because it really is important. Think of the social consequences of the radical individualism of Luther's theology, of that interiorization of religious practice. What it means really is a kind of rupture between theory and practice. What it means is that salvation is anchored not to what an individual does in his social relations, but it is anchored to what he feels in his heart. And think of how that diminishes or diffuses the revolutionary implications of the Trinity. For the Trinity, after all, was based upon the idea that God manifested himself through the intercession of the Son, but also in the Holy Spirit, which is, after all, the visible bonds of love in a community. What it is, is praxis in our particular terms. And this now disappears, or this now vanishes. And you can just weep in your imagination and think of what it means in capitalist society. If, after all, for the individual, the whole nexus between himself and his eternality uh, depends not upon what he is doing in that community, uh, but what he is feeling or claims to feel. And then, you see, it becomes much easier for a rich man uh, to achieve heaven uh, than for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. And yet, in 1517, when Luther made his attack, let's face it, it was a revolutionary attack. Because after all, at that point, the whole strategy of works in the Catholic Church had become a fiasco. And Luther's attack upon it, much more earth-shaking, shaking the earth and the ground from beneath the established order than any track of John Wycliffe's. Remember that the point of attack of Luther, remember that the provocation was the sale of indulgences. Now, indulgences, after all, is really quite something in the history of finance gathering. Because we're talking about something that is centuries old in the church. It is really a kind of system of high spiritual finance. And what it is is centered around the imagery of accumulated credits or merits in heaven and a kind of universal community chest uh, to distribute those merits. Because as the argument goes in Catholic uh, theology, uh, that when saints enter heaven, they come with many more merits than you need to get in. And consequently, the extra ones are accumulated in a common treasury of merits, and then they are dispensed uh, by the earthly church uh, to the deserving uh, upon the terrain. But over the centuries, as you can imagine, that became simply a very crass kind of money-making operation. And what it meant was that the poor and the indigent and those that had so little to spare were throwing their little coins into boxes all over the place with the idea that their sins would be remitted and the idea that the soul of some beloved departed would spring out of purgatory and would finally make it to heaven. 
And what was worse was that by the time you get uh, to the 15th and 16th centuries, you have huge sales, like great big immense sales of indulgences that are nationwide, uh, that are continent-wide, uh, that really are backed uh, by papal bulls. And the reason for that uh, shouldn't surprise us. And that is uh, that the inflation uh, got to the church also, and that they were constantly into uh, the bankers. The bankers like the, the, the banking house of the Fullers, and the Fullers were, after all, uh, the great creditors of the church. And consequently, uh, they went to the hierarchy, they went to the Pope, and uh, they wanted to be repaid. After all, they were Fullers, and they wanted to be repaid. <laughs> You get this linking of the whole indulgence campaign to of the, of the payment to bankers. And very frequently, you get specialized core of friars who really are super salesmen who specialize in the sale of indulgences. And they move around and they make the special pitch and they have the papal bull. And at their side is the agent of the great bank. And as the money falls into the plates and so forth, the bank gets half in order to uh, pay off uh, those debts that are owed. Now, Luther made no attack upon indulgences until those indulgences hit his own archbishopric and got close uh, to the city of Wittenberg. Uh, because in 1517, it was his own archbishop, Albrecht of Brandenburg, uh, who had a big debt to pay off. He had just become archbishop, and he owed the Fuggers 21,000 florins for having bought that office. And consequently, uh, he got papal permission for a big sale of indulgences in his archbishopric, and of course, the Fuggers would get half, and consequently, the debt would be paid off. Uh, what made it worse was uh, that this sale was conducted by a perfectly unscrupulous, specialized salesman, a Dominican friar named Hans Dietz, who goes under the name of Hetzel. And Hetzel moved around, and he was really something. And consequently, really belongs on some used car lot. <laughs> but it suffices to say that Hetzel went around, not only selling indulgences, but with a very sophisticated, graded price list, uh, for various sins uh, that you could buy off at different prices, and also uh, for the importance of various souls uh, that were to be sprung from purgatory. Uh, but the big thing, the big deal uh, that Tetzel offered uh, was to have these enclosed envelopes of credit uh, so that you could buy an envelope of credit which remitted a sin that you hadn't committed yet or were thinking about. <laughs> like our own that goes for years thinking that the oppression in Vietnam is a war for democracy has nothing to ask of other ages and credulity. But it suffices to say at any rate that there is a continuum which is very tragic and very sad of this kind of mumbo jumbo in almost all religious practice. I remember some years ago that my good Czech friend Ivan Brichter was telling me about an event that happened in the late 1920s in a little village near Bratislava uh, in uh, Slovakia. And he said uh, that somehow they had been digging around there, those peasants, and they found this bone, which looked like a very ancient bone, and pretty soon it was exalted into a box placed in the church and was there as a kind of place to worship and to give money because it was called the jawbone of Christ. Well, obviously, the neighboring village, uh, which uh, was lacking in money for his church, was very angry. And so they dug around, and they moved around, and they looked for something, some relic. And they finally found an old-looking bone, but rather small. And they put it in a box and exalted it, and called it the jawbone of Christ as a boy. <laughs> Some of the more credulous ones who run a Dane University invited me to give a lecture there. A Dane University is a university run by the Marian Order, the Order of the Virgin Mary. 
and they're the ones that run all these healing shrines by Lord and so forth. Well, I think Lord, and that's really something. I mean, you've got to check your imagination when you go there. I'm sure I'm too driven freaky. But it suffices to say at any rate that I went there. I'd written something on Peggy, a Catholic, the French Catholic poet, but I had written on him as with revolutionary potential. They didn't read that. They invited me. It was all a big mistake. But it suffices to say at any rate that being very, very genial, gentle, nice Catholic priests, they were very, very polite, and they agreed to show me in what they called the Mariological Institute, which was a great, huge library uh, that had a bibliography of 100,000 books on the Virgin Mary, which I considered one of the great tributes to the imagination ever. But, uh, <laughs> uh, they said that they ran all these healing shrines. I was interested in them. And they said, yes, yes, they had a new one now in the Philippines. Uh, it's this rose bush. Uh, that dropped these rose petals, uh, and in the veins uh, appeared the Virgin Mary. And he said, and we have a couple of samples here, and he showed it to me. I didn't see it. I was wondering where the veins, and, and I said, oh, well, I don't see it. And he clutched it back and said, well, these aren't the best samples. <laughs> Uh, all of this sort of thing, you see, becomes a continuum, and you don't get the feeling. In fact, even that Luther attacks that as much as he is attacking false security. Uh, what gives him propulsion is that he finds really an unwitting ally. And the ally uh, is uh, his own prince, uh, is the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise. Uh, because Frederick the Wise had his own uh, indulgence racket and didn't want any competition from the church. He had piled up a whole bunch of junk in front of the palace cathedral and called them religious relics, and peasants were supposed to come and workers and give money there. Tetzel coming into Wittenberg would mean a terrific competition. And so Luther, when he made his revolutionary attack, uh, would surely have uh, the support of his secular prince. And it came on the 31st of October uh, of 1517. Uh, for on that day, uh, Luther went uh, to the door of the cathedral church at Wittenberg and posted uh, those 95 theses uh, written in Latin, uh, which in their explicit direction uh, were an attack upon easy security, uh, an attack upon the idea uh, that something like uh, the purchase of indulgence uh, something like uh, easy ways of penance uh, could possibly, after all, assure the Christian uh, of the remission of sin and certainly uh, of salvation. Uh, but implicitly, it was an attack upon the authority uh, that dared uh, to do that. Uh, because in the 92nd thesis, uh, we read, a farewell uh, to those false prophets who say to the people of Christ, peace, peace, while there is uh, no peace. Now, Luther was not a conscious revolutionary when he did this. And you must understand that all the time he pulled back after things of this kind. Does he then not write uh, to the Pope, Leo X, after having made this attack, writes in 1518, Most blessed Father, I offer myself prostrate at your feet uh, with all that I am and all that I have. Call, recall, approve, reprove, even slay, as may seem good to you, and I will acknowledge your voice as the voice of Christ, residing and speaking in you. If I have deserved death, I will not refuse to die. Then what pushes Luther beyond where he would go? Why all this retention and then the release? He is pushed by the opposition. It is, after all, Tetzel who is going to say in May of 1518, whoever doubts indulgences attacks the Pope. So be it. Luther then will have to attack the Pope. But more than that, he is pushed by a puppet. Because you must understand, as Engels points out so brilliantly in that tract which has deservedly become a historical classic called The Peasant Wars in Germany, and Friedrich Engels points out how that Germany of that 16th century, that melange of principalities and duchies and electorates, was really rent with division, rent with suffering, rocked with discontent. It was smoldering with a quiet revolution. There were the princes, petty potentates, needing more money than they had, taxing mercilessly. There were the lesser nobility, their function as military personnel being taken away from them by new firearms and by infantry, and grinding down those peasants in order to keep up their status as knights.
And there were the different classes of the cities who after all resented those patriciates that controlled those cities. And there is the Lumpen proletariat of those cities beyond capitalism, beyond redeeming that society, smoldering with revolt. And at the base of it all, Engels tells us so very well, was that mass of peasants. At the bottom of all of the classes was the huge exploited mass of the nation, the peasants. It was the peasant who carried the burden of all the other strata of society. Princes, officialdom, nobility, clergy, patricians, and middle class. Whether the peasant was the subject of a prince, an imperial baron, a bishop, a monastery, or a city, he was everywhere treated as a beast of burden and worse. If he was a bondsman, the legal deliveries stipulated by agreement were sufficient to crush him even when they were daily being increased. Most of his time, he had to work on his master's estate. Out of that, he earned in his, out of what he earned in his due free hours, he had to pay tithes, dues, ground rents, war taxes, land taxes, imperial taxes, and other payments. And so Luther, in making an attack upon authority, somehow crystallizes discontents in that society. When the 95 Theses are translated into German and not used, Luther becomes a semi-hero in the society and hence responds to it. And so he goes to that debate in May of 1519 with Jan Eck, who is Johannes Eck, who is a professor of theology in the Bavarian University of Ingolstadt. And there he makes the debate. And when X says that in theological matters, authority is the court of final appeal, Luther responds and says, no, it is the Bible that is the court of final appeal. By this time, he is pushed further. The release begins to become a blow. And by this time, he is pouring his contempt upon what he calls that cesspool of satanic sodomy in Rome. <laughs> and by this time he is saying as he does in March 1520, it would be in Christian order to wash our hands in the blood of cardinals and popes. And so the Pope replies. And the Pope is a genial Medici Pope called Leo the Pen. And Thomas Mann was right when he said, much better to have dined on any given night with Leo X than with Martin Luther. <laughs> and so finally, Leo X does issue a paper bull, Exurge Domine, in which he attacks and condemns the Lutheran doctrine. Luther replies in a tract, the title of which should not escape you. It is the appeal to the <laughs> Christian nobility of the German nation. He appeals to the ruling class. He appeals to the secular authority, to the state, to come and cleanse the church. Nor should that surprise us. For insofar as Luther articulated a social theory, it was the unexceptional one of the Middle Age. It was the belief in an organic society, a society of orders and ranks, each in his rank, each with rights and obligations toward others in other ways. No way was Luther an outrider of capitalism, but even less was he the progenitor of any republic of communist saints that should be established in the 16th century. And yet, more difficult, more difficult to contain that revolt. By 1521, the breach becomes complete. For it is early in 1521 that the young new German emperor, the Habsburg king of Spain, Charles V, calls a special diet in the city of Bor in Germany and demands that Luther appear there and recant what he has said. And so Luther goes to the diet of Bor and arrives there the 16th of April of 1521. And there he is surrounded by followers, and he is cheered, and he is headed up by a band of robber barons known as three imperial knights. And he goes, and the emperor asks him to recant, and he says no, and if legend has it right, he says it with those words that came to be the crystallization of the spirit of defiance in modern history, 
Here stand I, I can do aught else. And the emperor understood the defiance. And he understood that all authority was here at stake. I am descended, said Charles V, only 21. I am descended from a long line of Christian emperors. A single friar who goes counter to all of Christianity for a thousand years, who denies popes and cardinals, is wrong and a threat to be exterminated. I will have no more to do with him. Luther was placed under the ban of empire, was an outlaw everywhere to be picked up, arrested, or bumped off wherever he moved. But he had the public. Could he not have called them out? Did he not have troops? Was there not a revolutionary implication in this? Of course there was, and he recognized it well enough, for he said later, had I desired to foment rebellion, I would have started the game at war, and the emperor himself wouldn't have been safe. But that was a fool's game. I left it to the word, the word without action. And so the elector of Saxony gave Luther protection in a fortress castle called the Markburg, and there he went and did not foment that revolution. But how to contain what he had unleashed? For while he was at the Vorther, he translated the Bible into brilliant German. And when preachers diffused it among the peasants, and the peasants heard the word, they were apprised of the fact that their oppression under feudalism was not prescribed by God. And furthermore, that when Luther was not there, in those Lutheran centers, among his own followers, a radicalism developed. There was no church left. There was no institution, so that anything went. And consequently, in his own Wittenberg, Karlstadt and others began to say that every Christian community has its right to set its own rules. And so it changed the math, and so it smashed saints, and so it said priests could marry, and that was too much for that Luther who believed then in authority. And so he came the 8th of March of 1522, and preached eight sermons in Wittenberg against this kind of religious radicalism and stemmed its time and created an institutional church left in the hands of safe bureaucratic persons. And a year later, in 1523, in March, he was to publish a tract which became fundamentally a tract of capitulation. For the tract is called On Civil Authority and Obedience Which Is Due to It. And in On Civil Obedience, On Civil Authority, what Luther argued was that the established order is a God given order, that God has ordained it, that princes, that the state has the obligation to keep law and order, and that it has the obligation and does God's work when it uses arms in order to keep that order. And yet, and yet, and yet as Lutheranism spread, surely there were two communities. Surely there were those who were the revolutionaries and those like the ones whom Gerald Strauss has studied in his excellent study of Lutheranism in Nuremberg, who were the patricians who saw in Lutheranism a form of social control. And so finally it is Engels who puts the question right. Luther had to choose between the two. Luther, the protege of the Elector of Saxony, the respected professor of Wittenberg, who had become powerful and famous overnight, the great man who was surrounded by a coterie of servile preachers and flatterers, did not hesitate a moment. He dropped the popular elements of the movement and joined the train of the middle class, the nobility, and the princes, and yet, and yet, how do you contain the word? And so Luther and the 16th century and the Reformation have to contend with Thomas Windsor, and they have to contend with the peasant war of 1500 and 1525. And that Windsor is the other face. That Windsor is the conscience. And he is a Lutheran. 
and a disciple of Luther. And he goes to the town of Zwickau in 1520, that town which was industrial, once brewing and cloth making, now prosperous in mining, but for a few, and most are not prosperous. And he is called as preacher, this Thomas Münzer, to Zwickau with the recommendation of Luther. But he preaches radical. He preaches attack on the rich. And no, they kick him out of Zwickau. And he wanders to Prague. And there he picks up Tabarite ideas, radical, revolutionary ideas. And consequently, in 1523, we find him in the town of Ostend. And Ostend is near Monsfeld. And it is a mining center. And there he makes an appeal to the miners. And by this time, Münzer really is a religious revolutionary and a social revolutionary. In his Manifesto to the Miners of 1523, he says, Beloved brothers, the pure fear of God before all else. Be warned. Do not be weak, indifferent. Fight the fight of your Lord. The time has come for change. The whole country is rising. To your work, to your work, to your work. Strike while the iron is hot. Let the sword not grow cold. And while he is preaching this, and going to the peasants in the countryside, and preaching biblical communism, and sending emissaries out from Auschwitz into Swabia, into other parts of Germany, all the time he is centering his attack on Luther for betraying the revolution. And he is beginning to use the kind of language that Luther himself uses, he is sermonizing against brother fattened swine. He is sermonizing against brother soft life. And finally, Luther replies. From the Wartburg, he replies in his letter to the princes of Saxony on the spirit of sedition. And he addresses it, or dedicates it, to the princes and lords of Germany. My gracious lords, as he says. And what Luther says in this address to the princes about sedition is that the word is not the problem, but the action that comes after the word is. A classic statement of the armchair radical. And so Luther says, it is not against the word preached at Alstadt, but against the raised fist at Alstadt that I urge sanctions. And so it is that Münzer is kicked out of Alstadt. And then six months later, by December of 1524, he is kicked out of the city of Munhausen, he is driven from pillar to post, finally ends up in the, city, uh, uh, in the city of Nuremberg, and there sits down to answer Martin Luther in a tract which is a classic of venom against the betrayer of a revolution. For the tract is called the title very well-founded apology and response to that spiritless creature of flesh who leads the good life at Wittenberg and who falsifies the Holy Scripture and who has besmirched Christendom in so totally dismal a manner. That is just the title. <laughs> From there, Luther is in turn called the Pope of Lutheran perverters, Dr. Lyon, Archdemon, Shameless Monk, Assassin, spiritless, soft living flesh of Wittenberg, which I would like to smell roasted on a cook in its own juice. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time Lipser gets down to the argument, it is as somebody who, after all, lives well, who gorges himself, and Luther had a horrendous appetite, ate far beyond any one person's capacity. That anybody who was into gluttony that way could not know what the poor were about. You who are so blind, you present yourself as a guide to the blind. What do you know, you who live in plenty, who have never done anything but eat and drink, what do you know of true faith? Then Luther is objectively against the people. By their words and acts, the nobles have so arranged it that the poor man, concerned the day long about his mere survival, doesn't learn to read. And they preach insolently that the poor man should let himself be spoiled by the tyrants. To all of that, Fraulein Martin, the Pope of Wittenberg, that chaste prostitute of Jadwa, 
has said amen. Then the appeal to the people. The entire community possesses the power of the sword and the key to salvation. From innumerable texts of the Bible, I have seen that the princes are not masters but servants. The greatest crime, the one of which Luther is guilty, is that no one wishes to take upon himself the misery of the poor. But the people, and its minister, will be free, and God will be their only master. And at that time, exploded the peasant revolution. And to be sure, Luther's response to that peasant revolution, you know, it is that urge radically to separate theory and practice. It is Luther in April of 1525 when the Swabian peasants had presented their 12 articles of liberation to destroy feudalism. It is Luther saying, neither injustice nor tyranny justify revolt. The articles which proclaim the equality of men on earth denies the spiritual reign of Christ. And then, three months later, in that horrendous tract called Against the Murdering and Pillaging Hordes of Peasants, Luther addresses the princes this way, kill and crush and dismember the peasants. You will not know a death more holy, for you are dying, for you are dying in obedience to the word of God and to the service of Christian love. And when it is that minister who goes among the peasants and who is captured and executed on the 27th of May of 1525, when that minister is killed, it is Luther who writes to Johannes Rievel on the 30th of June this way, Anyone who has seen Thomas Münzer has seen the devil incarnate in his greatest fury. O oh Lord, if such a spirit reigns among the peasants, it is time to slaughter them all like mad dogs. <clears throat> and yet it is this Münzer who, before he died, addressed himself this way to the peasants. My brethren and sisters, how long will you sleep? How long will you misunderstand the will of God? Arise, 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 it is time. Arise, arise, arise. Do not stand paralyzed. While your overlords live, you will never rid yourself of misery and fear. You will never know the will of God while they govern you. Arise, 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 and at no time be afraid. And so there are two faces, and the one which is turned to history and the one we always see, the revolutionary, is the one who eventually barricaded himself in the barber. But for the time being, contemplate, after all, the potentiality of that Ripserio word. Convulsive upheaval of the German peasants in the spring of 1525 that put the social practice of Lutheranism to the test. For after all, it had been Luther's own revolutionary assault upon the power and the authority of the Catholic Church, which had fueled the agitation of the peasantry of Germany. And it had been that agitation itself, once it escalated into a full-scale war against the nobility and against the princes of Germany, that threatened to undermine the established order, and to put in its place a society in which the exploiting classes would have no place. And yet, after all, Luther, when it came right down to it, that great insurgent, who had after all been able to hurl his power against the all-powerful Roman Church when it came to the peasant revolution of Germany in 1525, saved his greatest fury to attack the insurgent peasantry. Because you must understand that the Lutheran movement, after all, enrolled not only the radicalized masses of Germany, but it also included the governing elites, those who would accept the structured and the institutionalized Lutheran Church so long as that church guarded the social order, so long as that church became an instrument of social control. 
And even more to the point, you must remember, after all, that the obsessive concern of Martin Luther was about divine salvation, that fundamentally the cornerstone of his theology was a radical repudiation of that strategy of works as a pursuit of that salvation, and that a revolution which professed, after all, to set things right on earth, struck him as being the very epitome of that kind of self-delusion which was generated by the whole strategy of works. Because in the final analysis, after all, Martin Luther believed that humankind was, incor was corrupted to the point of no return, that it was a corrupted mankind for which nothing could be done by way of a social action or by way of work, and that fundamentally any effort uh, to try to establish through that puny will uh, that man had, uh, through that corrupted will uh, that after all was the mark of the human race, that any effort to try to establish some kind of utopia upon earth was the height of hypocrisy and the height of vanity. And consequently, in Luther's terminology and in Luther's view, the established order was in fact the God-given order. It was the order, after all, in which a corrupted race of humankind was forced to work and was forced to obey and was forced to suffer. That no one had the right to try to move out of the particular status and rank to which he had been assigned. And that no one had the right uh, to try to undo and unseat uh, that kind of society of ranks which was the God-given order. And in that light, that the ruling classes, the princes, and the nobility had a very special function in society, and that it was to keep order, that it was to protect, after all, that social hierarchy, and that toward that end, it was to use violence, it was to use force in order to do, after all, what God had ordained in order to protect God's handiwork. <coughs> So that the great paradox emerges that that very liberating Lutheran doctrine of justification by faith alone, when it is translated politically, becomes social order by force alone. And it is, after all, that peasantry of Germany in the spring of 1525 which would learn very tragically and the hard way how fundamentally and profoundly conservative Luther and his church were. But they would find that out only after they had taken up arms and mounted a war against a system which they came very close to unhinging. And it is not surprising to us that these peasants should have been insurgent in the 1520s. Because, after all, they are coping with a feudal system run amok. That there is no other place in Europe, with the exception of Eastern Europe, where the feudal reaction and the oppression of the ruling classes upon the peasantry was as bad as it was in Germany. Because the reason is the one we have set out over and again, that after all that runaway inflation of the 16th century had made it so difficult for the princes and the landed aristocracy to find the resources for their status. And so they had no other recourse but to dig those hooks ever deeper into the backs of a peasantry, to destroy custom, to destroy rule, to impose a feudalism worse than it had been in the period of the High Middle Ages. And against that, the peasantry revolted, because it is simply wrong to think of the peasantries of Europe as being somnolent always, as being passive. You go all the way back to the turn of the 16th century, and you see the peasantry of Central Europe plotting and conspiring and planning to take up arms. Already in the 1490s, they had formed in southern Germany a subversive organization, secret and conspiratorial, called the United Shoe, the Wooden Shoe, named after that wooden cloth that the peasant wore on his foot. <laughs> 
And that society planted cells in one corner of southern Germany to the other. And finally, in 1502, it mounted its first insurrection. And that was in the bishopric of Speyer in the Rhineland. Because it was in the Rhineland that this Abundschu or United Chu had its greatest concentrated strength. It had there some 7,000 militants. And when they mounted their insurrection against the Bishop Prince of Speyer, who was himself one of the most oppressive of all of those prince bishops of those ecclesiastical principalities, when they mounted that insurrection, their idea was nothing less less than to undo the feudal system, because their claim was now to end all feudal rents. Their aim was to end all ties to the church. Their aim was to end all work services and servile tenures. And their aim was even to end all taxes to the state. What you are talking about is another kind of society which is inscribed in the goal of that insurrection of 1502. Of course, a crushing defeat, because the authorities already knew the plans. They had been kept very secret, but that secret had slipped out. One of the militants, credulous enough to tell it in confession, and the priest, much more dedicated after all to the established order than to his vows, told the authorities, and the uprising was crushed, and the Bunshu almost crushed with it, but not quite, and it resuscitated, and by 1515, it makes a second insurrection even larger. In 1517, yet a third, all of them defeats, but all of them making the order tremble even more. And that last and third of those risings of the Bunshu had hardly been suppressed in 1517 when Martin Luther launched his attack upon the church and sent revolutionary vibrations uh, through the society. And so it was that between 1518 and 23, there is endemic revolt, especially among the peasants of southern Germany, of that area known as Swabia, uh, from the Swiss frontier almost to central Germany. And in that area, there is one local revolt after another, until by the spring of 1524, that whole region is in ferment. And we come to February of 1525, and we find those insurgent peasants grouped together in six great encampments, about 40,000 of them, dotting the landscape of Swabia in the south of Germany. And it is certain that they will begin an insurrection, and they do in the month of March of 1525, the beginning of the great German peasant war. And they attack the chateaus, and they burn them, and they burn the records. And what is it that they want? A minority of them, very revolutionary, influenced by Thomas Mincer and his preaching, and they want nothing short of the destruction of feudalism, but the majority more moderate, more realistic, if you please. And consequently, they inscribe their program in a document widely spread about in 1525 called the Twelve Articles. And the Twelve Articles, actually drawn up by two artisans, Lotzer and Schmidt, who have joined that movement, those Twelve Articles would not in themselves have ended the feudal mode of production. They would have humanized it, and perhaps to the point that it was unworkable. Because what the Twelve Articles called for, in brief, was a severe reduction of tithes to the church, a large reduction of ground rents, a large reduction of the taxes to the state, the return of common lands to the peasantry, the election of priests and their removal by the congregations themselves. And so you see, there is a question 
even if we say that that is not fundamentally anti the system, could the system have survived if its economic surplus were stripped from it as those 12 articles after all foresaw? And if the ruling class refused those 12 articles, would there not be violent class war which would radicalize that peasantry even more? And so that insurrection began and at the side of the peasants was, of course, that symbol of the Revolutionary Reformation, Thomas Mincer. For Mincer, it was the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth, or so he hoped. It was the beginning of the end for that exploitative system. And yet he is an acutely intelligent man, and he understands the weakness in this peasant insurrection. It will succeed, he thinks, only if the peasants really are united in their goal, if they all have a certain level of political consciousness, only if the peasants choose leaders from their ranks who will not betray them, and especially only if the peasants unite their action and don't engage in local actions here and there. And all of those weaknesses were there. Because if there are insurgent peasants in these armies, there are also lots of open proletarians, the complete déracine of the society, who are much more ponderers, much more of uh, um, simply, uh, simply out of outcasts of society than they are revolutionaries. And also at the leadership in the command of so many of these peasant units are defunct nobles, nobles who claim to be making solidarity with this uprising. And some of them did, but most of them were taking command of these peasant armies in order to betray them. But the basic and classic weakness, what would destroy this peasant uprising, was its disunity. It is the point I once made about the movements of the 14th and 15th century, that the class consciousness was negative, a hatred of the enemy class, but still a very low level of positive class consciousness, that after all, all of the peasantry ought to band together with a single strategy in a single war. As it was, they fought separately, one fought in one place, another unit in another place, and all too frequently susceptible to the co-optation of nobility and princes who made empty promises and consequently got the peasants uh, to disarm themselves. But nonetheless, Mincer was with them. He could do aught else, and we find him in March of 1525 in the city of Mulhausen, which is a city in Thuringia near the mining districts. And there he had been expelled in late 1524 on the orders of Martin Luther. But he came back in March of 1525. And it is no accident that seven days after he arrived back, there was a revolution in Mulhausen. And consequently, that rank and file petty bourgeois, the small merchants and the craftsmen throughout those merchant oligarchs who had controlled the city government and you now have a radical democracy in charge of the city of Mulhausen, and they appoint this Thomas Münzer as the preacher of the local church, and he himself organizes a secret league of his followers who are dedicated to communism, about 300 of them, and he uses his pulpit in order to appeal not only to the insurgent peasants not to give up and to go further, but to appeal also to the miners of the area around Munhausen and around Monster that they should join that peasant uprising, that they should end this system too, and he makes headway among the miners, and they become turbulent. But on the question of unity of the peasants, there is no success. And consequently, they fight separately, and separately they begin to be <coughs> defeated. And it is at the end of April of 1525 
that the so-called Swabian League, which is the League of the Nobles and of the Princes of South Germany, has banded together sufficiently with an army to really defeat that insurrection in the South. They will not bargain, they will not talk about the 12 Articles, they will only crush. By the end of April, it is the non grab Philip of, of Hesse who crushes the movement in his Principality of Hesse. And it is at the end of April that mercenary armies raised by these princes begin to invade Franconia and Thuringia, that real revolution which had spread through southern and central Germany all the way into Alsace in the west, piece by piece being defeated and emasculated. At the beginning of May, there is only one stronghold left, and it is the stronghold of the city of Frankenhausen. And Frankenhausen is where the last peasant army was encamped. Outside that city, 10,000 strong. Not a good choice, not a well-fortified city. And Münzer, in order to help that army at Frankenhausen, really called upon the miners of his district to go and help with arms. He called upon the citizens of his own town of Munhausen to help. He called upon those of Erfurt, masses, go and help those who are of your class. And no one responded. And so Minster went with his own followers, his own band of communists, and went on the 12th of May and entered the lists of the peasant army at Frankenhausen. And by the 15th of May, it is Philip, the Langrad of Essa, who is now in alliance, good Lutheran that he is, now in alliance with George, the elector of Saxony, good Catholic that he is, proving that class runs thicker than religion, and the two of them combined in an army about to attack that peasant army. And those princes tell to the peasant army that they will make a truce if that army gives up Thomas Münster, and they say no, and the battle is fought. That crucial battle of Frankenhausen on the 16th, of 15th and 16th of May of 1525. And the peasants are outnumbered, and they are out, uh, outmaneuvered, and certainly in equipment they cannot compete, they are crushed. On the 16th of May, they are the princely mercenary armies that enter the city of Frankenhausen. And the order is given that those mercenary troops are to kill on sight and that they are to plunder at will. And it is Philip the Langram of Hesse himself who later wrote, all males and there were summarily slain and the town given over to pillage. And of course the prize was Münster. And he was taken prisoner. And he was brought before the princes and they said, you have done this, and why is it that you rouse up these semi-barbaric peasants? Why is it that you disturb the social order? Why have you done this heinous thing? To which he replied, I have acted rightly to destroy your power. And so there would be no mercy for him, sir. And so he was mercilessly tortured on the rack. And then finally he was given over as though a booby prize to Count Ernest of Monsfeld. Because when he had been preaching at Austed, Münzer had made a special target of that count. And he had called him a rogue and a robber. And the count didn't like it. And he had Münzer now. And so the torture was terrific. And the torture was there in order to get a confession that he had done the whole thing that the peasants otherwise would have been happy, and more than that, to get the names of that secret conspiratorial communist society of his, he would not give the names, not a single one. Under torture, he did write a confession that yes, he was responsible for the peasant uprising, and at the very bottom of that confession, 
He wrote in Latin the words, Omnia sunt communia, which are the words out of Acts 2.44, and all shall be owned in common. And so it was that Minster, at dawn on the 27th of May of 1525, was beheaded, and the radical and revolutionary reformation had lost its primary symbol. Now the peasants, when they drew up the Twelve Articles, sent a copy to Martin Luther. Because in those Twelve Articles, the peasants spoke simply and with dignity, and the authority that they cited was the Bible that Luther had translated for them. And consequently, they wrote in the Twelve Articles, Seeing that Christ has redeemed and brought us all with the precious shedding of his blood, the lowly as well as the great, we will retreat only if our capitulation is justified to us with arguments from the scripture. Otherwise, we demand that each, for his work, get according to the several necessities of all, that there shall be no in the society whose surplus is so taken that he cannot survive. Luther got those 12 articles. He had been cringing in fear in the month of March, taking no position, but having received the 12 articles, wrote the first of his tracts on the peasant problem and addressed the peasants themselves in what was called an earnest exhortation to all Christians warning them against insurrection and rebellion, in which Martin Luther says to the peasants, now listen to me, I am authority and I tell you this, no insurrection is ever right, no matter what the cause. My sympathies are and always will be with those against whom insurrection is made. And he expected the peasants to follow, and they did not. And he was sore angry. And it was just like Hans, not getting the obedience of Martin. And here he was, justifying himself to the Father again, that he would demand authority, and he wrote that ferocious pamphlet against the robbing and murdering hordes of peasants, which was published before the Battle of Brunkhausen, and in which we read this. A rebel is not worth answering with arguments, for he does not accept them. The answer for such mouths is a fist that brings blood from the nose. When barbaric half-animals warms up, the prince serves heaven better by shedding oceans of blood than by praying. And do you not have there the justification for the terrible decimation of the Anabaptists by the princes in the 1520s and 30s? And do you not have the words that you could put on a plaque in front of any police station or any concentration camp in the most repressive society? And do you not have in Luther's own biography, his way of reconciling himself finally in love with that brutal and authoritarian father that he could do it just as well. And the political consequences of that are terrific. They are terrific, you see, because Lutheranism then came to give an ideological gloss on the power of princes and ruling classes. For Central Europe, it is faithful, because what it meant was there would always be justification and mystification in the mass for the right of a prince to keep order by force under any circumstances, any time. It creates the authoritarian, it creates the patriarchal state, the patriarchal family, the patriarchal society, all of it glossed over, all of it justified by the client church. Look, go into the middle of the 19th century and read the words of that sensitive, holy genius, Friedrich Nietzsche. And he who suffered so much 
from that pietistic Lutheran culture, from that patriarchal society in which everything filtered from top to bottom, ordered from the male authority all the way down. And hear what Luther says about the structure, about the, what Nietzsche says about the structure of that society in the space Zarathustra. The patriarchal state seeks the support of its Lutheran priesthood. Those comfortable, unctuous, pompous, bourgeois, married pastors. Because it knows how to value lackeys who apparently and outwardly serve quite other interests. Thus, thus, regressive patriarchal states and the careful preservation of religion go necessarily hand in hand. In July of 1525, a bare six weeks after Thomas Münzer really was bouldering in the ground, compulsively, Martin Luther got married and made his final amends for rebellion. And Münzer, and that was on Luther's conscience, and he couldn't get over it, and he returned to it over and again, and you find him ten years later, for example, saying something fascinating if you are into the whole question of the psychology of someone who confronts a movement and can't go with it to its logical end. That Münzer he despised because it is that Münzer who said where it might have gone. And so ten years later, we find Martin Luther saying, I acted against him and the peasants because that bedeviled creature, Mincer, wanted to usurp my Christ. <laughs> and there was suffering that was physical. And so it is Erickson who talks about the suffering every time that sense of what Mincer was came to mind. And so he broke out in severe sweats and into severe fits of crying. He was sure that death was impending and felt in such faithful moments without faith and justification. <clears throat> Above all or below it all, he was depressed and deprived of self-esteem. Even when he was free from those acute attacks, he suffered from indigestion, constipation, hemorrhoids, kidney stones, which eventually caused him severe pain. And from an annoying susurrus, as he called it, a buzzing in the ears. This buzzing was originally caused by a chronic middle ear infection, but that had been cured, and it stayed on to become the mediator between his physical and his mental torments. And who knows, but that he might not have heard that voice of Mincer in that buzzing ear, and certainly have seen over and again the bloody cadaver and the clenched fist and the raised fist and the authentic reformation. And so the peasants learned and the ruling classes learned. And the peasants learned what the cost, after all, of rebellion was. And the ruling classes learned what the efficacy of repression was. And yet, you see, the Reformation sent revolutionary vibrations through that society that simply wouldn't go away. And so we confront that very interesting fact that in the second quarter of the 16th century in Germany, that there is a time of revolt and subversion, a time when there are desperate and exalted militants who go to the most radical texts of the Bible for their inspiration, when they insist that communism is the only way, and when in the final analysis they do not build their case upon a mass church but they organize themselves in small, conspiratorial, heretical, communistic sects. What we are saying is that the movement of the 1520s and 30s moves from a mass movement to a movement of professional revolutionaries 
or to put it in 16th century terms, to those religious sectarians who, after all, have been rebaptized into the Christian commitment and who will make that revolution without compromise or pause if they finally, if they possibly can. And you know, of course, that we are talking about how the revolutionary baton was passed in the 1520s from the earliest stage of the Reformation, from the great peasant insurrection to the Anabaptist movement. And that Anabaptist movement is of some importance. And you see, it does carry the whole problematic of the Reformation and of the option of the 16th century to still another dimension. Those Anabaptists, after all, were not anything but religious radicals in their origin. They were, after all, those who rejected a great deal of stress upon theology, who rejected a great deal of stress upon ritual. In place of theology, they placed the restructuring of society. In place of ritual, they placed praxis. In other words, the workings of a society in which Christian love should be manifested. And they emerge in Zurich, in the Reformation in Zurich, in Switzerland, in 1524 and 5. And the central symbol that makes them Anabaptists is adult baptism, a rejection of infant baptism, which means that those who go into the Christian community must have a commitment. They want only professional revolutionaries in their sect, and consequently not until you are ready can you really enter into that commitment. And how important are they? How important are they statistically, geographically? We have the data well spelled out for us. There is a very recent book by a historian named Peter Clausen. Not a very good book from the point of view of any thinking, but lots of data that really are strewn, strewn through that book. And so with a great deal of energy, Professor Clausen has determined for us that there were in the 16th century about 30,000 Anabaptist militants. Not a very large number when you start to think about the millions in that society of Central Europe. But don't sell it short. Because you're dealing with 30,000 militants, 98% of whom really are of the laboring poor, are really peasants who are defunct peasants or are urban wage earners or are the unemployed. In other words, you're dealing with a proletarian group, which means that their access to the rest of society, their entree into the community, is much easier, much readier, if you please, than for, let us say, the sects of socialist intellectuals uh, in the 19th century. And add to that the fact that Carson has told us that at one time or another in the 16th century, those Anabaptists had influence of some minimal sort at least in 2,000 towns or villages, which is a wide reach for that movement. And so, after all, it springs in Switzerland, and it moves into Austria, and it moves into southern Germany, and finally makes its greatest impact in northwest Germany and in the Low Countries. By 1530, its impact in the South and in Austria is over. It has been repressed. But it's at that point that it makes its center in that northwest Germany and in Holland where its impact will begin to send fear through the ruling classes of Europe. And northwest Germany, and you have to understand that what we're talking about is a very backward area an area that is a melange of ecclesiastical principalities, little principalities ruled over by what are called prince bishops, the two largest of which were the Archbishopric of Cologne and the Bishopric of Münster. And it is about Münster that much of the rest of this story has to be told. 
Now, in these areas, you get a very close connection, quite obviously, between the church or the uh, church hierarchy and the feudal aristocracy. Because the prince bishop in these ecclesiastical states is elected by a so-called little parliament called the chapter. And in the chapter, you get only the landed aristocrats as members, only they vote, so that the prince bishop is always one of their number, whether he is ordained a priest or not, and obviously represents the interests of that ruling class. And what you get is a very severe oppression then of those who are the rank and file in the society. An oppression that takes the form of excessive taxation. These ecclesiastical principalities, you have to understand, are constantly required to send sums of money to the Roman Curia, in other words, to the Catholic Church in Rome, and consequently the tax burden is especially severe. It is not paid uh, by the church hierarchy, it is not paid by the aristocracy, it is paid, after all, by the laboring poor. And so you have tension in those particular societies. And the springboard, or the fulcrum, for any potential revolt is not the town council. The town council in a city like Münster, for example, is an oligarchic town council uh, with a group of rich merchants who really are in alliance uh, with the nobility and with the prince bishop. The real fulcrum of opposition comes from the guilds. And in the city of Münster, uh, by 1530, the 16 leading guilds of that city had united into a single large guild as a terrific springboard for opposition, an opposition that could lead uh, the rank and file in that very important uh, capital city uh, of the bishopric uh, of Münster. And so it took some event to catalyze a rising. And you get it slightly in 1525. In Northwest Germany, the only place where you find a repercussion of the peasant war is in those ecclesiastical principalities. In Münster, the United Guild forced now of the chapter, the so-called feudal nobility, to grant certain concessions. But once the peasant war was crushed, those concessions were taken away. But by 1530, that society in that backward ecclesiastical principality is really sitting on a volcano. Because you get a series of catastrophes. You get, for example, the reappearance of the Black Death in Westphalia that hits that particular bishopric of, of, of Münster. You get, in the second place, a crop failure in the year 1529. Between 1529 and 31, the price of foodstuffs, of basic rye grain, is tripled. And add to that, in 1530, an extraordinary tax which is imposed so that the emperor of Germany, Charles V, can fight a war against the Turks <coughs> who are invading his eastern lands. All of that means that you get social turmoil that becomes endemic in the city of Münster and takes the form of a religious attack. And so it is that in the year 1530 appears a young preacher named Bert Rothmann. And Rothmann, himself a Catholic to begin with, begins to turn Lutheran and begins to get a huge audience and consequently by 1532 rouses up the guild structure of that particular city to force the town council to oust its Catholic preachers and to replace them with Lutherans. Now obviously, uh, the bishop is discontented and consequently, uh, in the face of that challenge, uh, would like simply to crush that city, has no resources. Uh, the emperor, Charles V, engaged in the wars against the Turks and consequently, at the beginning of 1533, the bishop, the prince of that particular principality, must capitulate, says yes, that that city of Münster is in fact a Lutheran city. And then come the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists, persecuted in other places, begin to come into the city of Münster. And they come from the city of Strasbourg in the south, where they are driven out. 
and they come from the city of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where there is unemployment, where the new industry, the putting out system, has really begun to undermine the guilds of the city, and where journeymen and apprentices have no work. And these Anabaptists come into the city of Münster, and they are under the influence of a visionary named Melchior Hoffman. And Hoffman was one of these guys who suddenly saw a connection. The year 1533, he said, is the 15th centenary since the death of Christ. And consequently, that will be the year one of the millennium. And so the Anabaptists begin to get a following among the poor of the city of Münster. And finally, it is Rothman himself, the most popular preacher in the town, who turns from Lutheranism to Anabaptism, and there follow behind Rothman all of those other Lutheran preachers, and now the town council becomes worried. Now there is radical talk spreading about everywhere. In 1533, they oust these Anabaptist preachers, bring back Lutheran preachers who are safe, and there is a popular rising. The Anabaptists come back. And so you come close to a revolution. And the revolution comes in those early months of 1534. Because by the 2nd of February of 1534, there was a march by the Anabaptists which seized the city hall. And what they insisted was that the town council now oust from any kind of preachment anyone but an Anabaptist and proclaim the city to be a city of saints. At that point, there will have to be struggle. The bishop himself wants to send an army in. He has no army. Finally, Two weeks later, the 21st of February of 1534, the city is seized, the town council is occupied by the Anabaptists, and they proclaim the New Jerusalem. Well, a communist state, a communist city in the 16th century. And so the Anabaptists now pour in from everywhere. Obviously, they have their mecca, and consequently, the rich begin to leave as fast as they can get the hell out. They take as much property with them as they can, but they must leave a great deal behind. And in this influx into the city of Münster, come those men who will be the leaders of this revolution. There is young Matisse, and Matisse is a banker in Harlem, in the Netherlands. And he now is the one who really makes the relationship between social change and class violence, who preaches the fact that there will be no real structural change in the society unless there is a destruction of the ruling class. Behind him comes one young Bokelson of the city of Leiden, known as John of Leiden. And he, a remarkable leader, an extremely attractive man, one widely traveled, himself an apprentice and then a journeyman tailor, who had been down to Lisbon, up to England, into the Hanseatic cities, only 25 when he got down to the city of Münster, but with a tremendous charisma, somebody that could really project this communist revolution that was going to take place in that city. But from the very beginning, note it well, the bishop does raise a mercenary army, and from the start of that Anabaptist experience in that city, the most important single communist experience in an urban area in the 16th century, one that lasts 15 months, that from the very beginning, that city is under siege, it is at war. And that, of course, creates havoc right from the start. What was it like in the kingdom of saints? What was it like in the New Jerusalem? Who knows? Because you see, by the time that city fell, in June of 1535, and the invading army came in, everybody left standing was slaughtered. And so the only accounts that we have come from the people who despised the experience. And so you get two charges leveled at the experience in Münster. One was that it was one long 
filthy sexual orgy, <laughs> and the other that it was one long bloodletting experience of terror and tyranny. And of course, those charges are made over and again by, about all kinds of experiences. The charge of sexual irregularity, one of the great charges made in history in order to be smirch an experience, to be smirch a politician, or what have you. And consequently, we have no evidence for that, except, after all, what these hostile sources say. One thing is clear from the sources, and that is that John Matisse, and then who was killed at Easter in 1534, John of Leyden, who became the leader after that, that both of them, and all of the saints that followed them, were committed to communism, to the idea that there ought to be some effort to recreate the society on those other grounds. And consequently, we know that they did expropriate the property of the rich, that they created common storehouses and distributed according to need, and that they uh, simply canceled all debts, uh, that they abolished money in transactions, that they had an ideal which John of Leiden summed up this way. Everything which has served the purposes of self-seeking and private property, such as buying and selling, working for money, taking interest and practicing usury, or eating and drinking the blood and sweat of the poor, all such things are abolished amongst us by the power of love and community. How far they got, we don't know. We know, for example, that the patriarchal family still existed. We know that there were no especial rights for women. We know, certainly, that there was no abolition of the relationship between master and journeyman. But you're talking about an effort to create something under siege and at war. And what, after all, did the Paris Commune manage to accomplish under similar circumstances? Very little, because you're constantly rallying your resources in order to fight the enemy. What really is remarkable is the military talent of John of Leyden to keep the bishop's army at bay for 15 months, and more, the commitment of that population, facing starvation at every turn, and yet rallying its morale, having collective games, having collective theater, all of that comes out in the critical reports about the experience of Minster, and all of it means that those armies, that those peoples who have something to fight for, fight after all, one hell of a lot better than the mercenary armies outside. Finally, of course, the thing was lost. It was lost on the basis of food. There was no food, and starvation was widespread. And consequently, by the 25th of June of 1535, the invading army went into the city of Münster. And it killed those who were standing, and women had played a notable part in the last defense of the city of Münster, and they were cut down. And those that survived were told that they, could, that they would be given uh, a, a amendment, that they would be set free if they recanted. Of their anabaptism, and very few did, and the others were decapitated. And the prize was John of Leyden, and that had to be something exquisite, and consequently he was put in chains in 1535, in June, and for six months he was paraded around the bishopric of Münster like a dancing bear, and he was beaten, and he was branded, until finally in January of 1536, because ruling classes are peculiarly exquisite, he was tortured publicly in the central square of the city of Münster with hot branding irons until he died. And Kowalski, not my favorite in history, <laughs> but Kowalski, who has written a most interesting book called Communism in Central Europe in the 16th century, an old book but still fairly interesting. And Kowalski makes a comment at the end of his book, which I quote to you. A modern historian has the effrontery to call this, talking about the death of John of Leyden, to call this merited punishment for misdeeds. We challenge the noble masters of German historical science to point out a single instance in which 
during the terrors of the sea, the uneducated, rough proletarians of Minster practiced on their enemies a hundred part of the blood burdening cruelties which the right reverend bishop, in perfect tranquility of mind, had prepared and carried out before his own eyes six months after his victory. Yet these gentlemen, who cannot too highly extol their own transcendent ethics, exult over the triumph of the priestly bloodhound while they drag his victims through the modern and infamous criminals. One of the better passages in tons of writing of Karl Schmitt. In a very excellent book on Thomas Münzer, which is written more than 50 years ago, by a great socialist philosopher in Germany named Ernst Bloch, which is called Thomas Münzer as Revolutionary and still stands as a great classic. Ernest Bloch poses a question that I leave with you about this experience of the peasant war, about the experience of Münzer, about the experience of the city of Münster under the Anabaptists, and poses this question. Was this all before its time? In other words, was this desire for a peasant democracy on the part of the uh, German peasantry simply a nostalgia for a past that was gone? While with Münzer and those Anabaptists in the Northwest, you're really dealing with something wholly utopian, wholly premature. That after all, they were trying to build a communist or a socialist society without having passed through the stage of capitalism. And it is Ferdinand Lassalle, the 19th century German socialist whom Bloch quotes. And Lassalle says, no, you see, objectively, in the peasant war, the princes were revolutionary and not the peasants because the princes were going to strengthen the state, and consequently, capital could become accumulated and concentrated, and you would begin to develop the system out of which socialism would come. And Kautsky, really aping Engels on that question, says much the same thing when he says that the tragedy of Münzer was to have come at a time as a real revolutionary before it was possible to have the proletarian revolution that he wanted. To which Ernst Bloch, who could run intellectual circles around Kautsky any day, still do it backward. And it is Ernst Bloch at this point who then asks this question. If it is true that in a country where presumably the industrial conditions Marx had laid down for socialism were absent, the Bolsheviks succeeded in implanting a communist regime by force of will tied to the communist ideal embedded in popular imagination, can we really say that Münzer is a Don Quixote for having neglected on the way to communism the intermediary stage of capitalism. And I tell you, you see, that the theory of stages hasn't had a good track record in modern revolutionary history. And that fundamentally, those advanced societies, which presumably should go socialist, have all kinds of resistances to that. And third world societies have great revolutionary potential. And furthermore, that if you look really closely at the great revolutionary militants of our time, if you look, for example, into that magnificent passage in Lenin's What is to be Done, where he talks, after all, about the dream and the power of the dream, <coughs> then you understand that these kinds of militants have anchored their courage to that kind of insight that William James had when he was really talking about the infinite creativity and sometimes the surprise and always the potentiality of human beings. In that remark he made when he said, just because you've never seen a white crow doesn't mean one doesn't exist. Think, if only Luther 
had had a sliver of that faith in human creativity, might it not have been different?